Welcome to the West Virginia Case Podcast, hosted by Les Odell. Join us as we dive deep into all things strange, including Bigfoot, aliens, ghosts, and more. Pull up a chair and set for a spell. It's going to be a great time. Now, without further delay, let's get the show started. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The show starts in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey everybody, welcome back to the West Virginia Case Podcast. Uh, tonight, we're going to be joined with Teresa and Brian of Spectral Research and Investigations in, from Huntington, West Virginia. I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, we're going to have some more guests coming up here in the next month or so, about every Thursday at 7 o'clock. Uh, it's going to be a fun time. We're going to have a great time talking to some folks. Tonight, we're going to talk to Brian and Teresa about their their experiences uh, in the paranormal, uh, how they got started in the paranormal, uh, they'll talk about their investigations and, and and how their group got started. And with that, we'll go ahead and bring them in. Hello. Hey, guys. How you doing? Doing okay. okay well, I'm going to thank, thank you all for coming. And, coming and, uh, you're oh, we got feedback again. Thank you all for coming. And, uh, yeah, just um, we'll just start out with how, how, how did everybody get started? What uh, – or not, let's not start, start there. Start let's there. Just, just tell me about yourself. Each one of you tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay, Teresa. Um, I'm pretty boring. <laughs> um, I'm Teresa. If anybody recognizes me, you might have seen me around uh, Teresa's haunted history of the tri state. Um, basically, I don't really have a whole lot of interest outside the paranormal. I'm a mom to a teenager, so. You know, between school and jujitsu and all that fun stuff, there's there's not a whole lot of time to have too many interests. So I dedicate mm-hmm. what time I do have to paranormal investigating, paranormal research, writing about it, and mm-hmm. all that fun stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. And my name is Brian Clary. I'm a teacher. Um, got two boys, one eight, one sixteen months. He was just on here just a moment ago. Um, don't have a whole lot of time either, honestly, just because of everything that goes on top of that. I'm working on my doctorate in history. I'm a historian. I'm currently working on my dissertation to kind of finish up. I've been actually working on that really heavily the last two weeks, um, close to 70 pages in two weeks. So that's had a much of my attention the past couple of weeks. Um, I've always been passionate about the history side, the paranormal side. Um, I know you're going to ask the question in a minute anyway, how we got started, but kind of started as a young, a young one anyway. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I, that's my next, que- next question is how, how do y'all get into it? Uh, like m- me, it was through uh, something that happened to as a, as a kid, something happened to me as a kid. Uh, what about you guys? How, what, uh, what got you into the paranormal the interest, what, what what made it be there? Go ahead and start, Teresa. Okay. Um, I don't really have, like, one defining moment. It just seems like everything in my life kind of led to the paranormal. Um, I am Appalachian, West Virginia, born and raised. Um, so were my grandparents. So my grandparents really kind of started this whole process for me. They brought over a lot of you know, their Appalachian folklore, the granny witch, you know, stuff. And I spent a lot of time with them, especially like over the summer. And instead of like bedtime stories, my grandparents would tell me ghost stories from, Mm -hmm. you know, when they were little. And so that kind of really got the ball rolling. Um, And things really kind of came to a head when I was about in middle school. And we had moved into this house that everybody thought was haunted. And everybody that's been there has had some sort of weird experience. And it really kind of started that my mom, especially, was a huge skeptic. 
And she would give me these blanket statements like, well, this couldn't be paranormal because of this. And I knew that not everything that we were experiencing was paranormal, but I wasn't happy with these like blanket statements. And so that's when I kind of really started researching for myself, the actual ghost hunting, you know, side, you know, what I, I loved the folklore and the history, but let's look at the mechanics of how this stuff, why this stuff works. Um, and, you know, so I lived in that house um, up until, you know, I moved out on my own as an adult. My mom lived there till her death, so we spent a lot of time there. And I kind of figured at an early age that, you know, I had this experience living in a haunted house. Plus, I had this knowledge that I had, you know, tried to gain for myself to try to figure things out. Is there a way that I can kind of help people, you know, who are dealing with similar issues? Um so this was, I graduated high school back in 2001, and let me tell you, West Virginia had two paranormal <laughs> investigation teams in 2001 um, that, you know, that had like an online presence, right. and neither one of them wanted an 18-year-old girl, <laughs> neither one of them wanted anything to do with me, they wouldn't even answer my emails, um, mm -hmm. so I started kind of doing stuff on my own a little bit, um, 2004, 2005, I actually found a local group based in Huntington, um, they were a bunch of, they were older people who were doing this in their spare time. They kind of took me under their wing, so to say, and I learned a lot from them. Unfortunately, since they were older and, you know, the, the, the group didn't really last all that long. Um, and so luckily I was able to find a new group that had popped up shortly thereafter. And ever since then, I've pretty much, you know, have been investigating straight since 2001. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. So you've been in you've been in it for a while then. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even before that, you know, like my buddies and stuff in high school, we do the whole legend tripping thing. Yeah. We'd go to like the haunted cemeteries or haunted bridges and did you did you have an experience at all when you was a child or just it just because of the stories? Okay, so when I was really young, apparently I would talk to people that weren't there. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I don't know if that was just if that was anything paranormal or not um my grandparents maybe kind of thought it was and kind of encouraged that a little bit then there right. was a period of time where i lost that ability largely but then when we moved into the haunted house when i was like nine or ten uh, yeah we had all kinds of crazy experiences where was that at what? it's in winfield in winfield yep so you're, you're still you're still around home then even even today yeah i never Stray too far away. I always return back home. Nice. What about you, Brian? So the stories that kind of got me into it more than anything else were things that happened to me personally. Um, growing up, when I was little, we moved up from Texas because my dad was on Fort Hood uh, when I was really little. I was born down there. We moved back up here where most of my family's from. And we moved into a parsonage just down the road from where I am right now, a little place attached to a church and they were renting it out. And uh, I think I was like three or four at the time when we were renting it. And at that point, you're just kind of becoming more like self-aware and aware of the things that are going on around you. And I remember being just really little and I remember events like around Christmas time and stuff like that of like seeing the doors kind of moving kind of strangely mm -hmm. and lights coming on and on or off with no real explanation. Um, things that just, you knew even as a little kid, Hey, in the summertime when the windows are open and it's windy and it's pulling the suctions, pulling, it's going to slam the doors and things like that. Do you have still some kind of familiarity of, wait a minute, this isn't quite that, but you couldn't really explain it. We had issues in that house growing up, and then we moved out of there and moved into another home. Really didn't have a whole lot of experiences and stuff there. But after my parents got divorced when I was about eight, um, my mother, uh, she was kind of off doing her own thing. Uh, my dad ended up with custody of me, but he was an over-the-road truck driver. So I actually, most of the time, custody-wise, I was actually with my grandparents. But on the weekends, when he was back in town, I would stay pretty close to where I am now, just about two miles up the road towards Green Bottom. Um, 
he lived in a trailer that he rented from this older couple. The older the trailer was like an old 50s, 60s camper that had been converted into like a single wide. And we would stay up there on the weekends. And I remember one real major event that kind of like got me in this direction was that, and I found out later on that he was having experiences there, but he didn't lead on any of this stuff beforehand because I guess he didn't want to spook me or anything like that. But there were a couple experiences that I remember real heavily. One, there was one night that I was staying there in the house and he had already went to bed and I've had trouble with insomnia since I was a little kid. So it was one of those nights where I couldn't sleep. So I was sitting in the living room uh, watching television It's like 1 or 2 a.m. And he went to bed. I know where he was at that time. And he had like a flag covering his window to where you couldn't see in instead of blinds. And I remember sitting there on this TV, and this was really early in the morning, and I heard like what this was a tapping on the glass of the window. And it was a rhythmic like tapping. It wasn't like a bird or like a bug buzzing into the window because it saw light or anything like that. And I remember even being a little kid and I was like, hey, I don't know, I don't like this. And there was no way in God's green earth you were going to get me to look out that window to see what it was. Fast forward a little bit. And as we stayed there longer, he had a room in this house that wasn't really a bedroom per se, but it was kind of like a cut. And there was like a pullout couch there that he slept or that he let me sleep on. And I'm sorry, I got a visitor here. Um, (laughs) But I had this little pull-out couch that I would sleep on. And I remember being able to lay there at night and watching somebody walk up and down this hallway, but I knew it wasn't him because I could I could hear him snoring in his bedroom, which was right next door. Um, and we'd see just kind of like this like image of somebody. It wasn't like a full-body deal. It was kind of like an outline or a shadow or something like that of somebody walking. Well, then... One morning, it was my second grade year, I had a social studies fair that I was involved with. And we had to put together a project, and I chose something on the Civil War Battle of Chickamauga. So we were putting that all together, and it was like a little diorama and like a little thing. And he and I worked on it all weekend. And Monday morning came around, and the, the social studies fair was supposed to start. So I got up that morning and was getting ready for school. Standing and brushing my teeth and stuff like that. And at the back door, I was looking out at the back door and his the house actually sat above the Ohio River. And he and the property owner had a bunch of like old trucks and cars and stuff like that on the property. And I remembered seeing a gentleman running around on the bank of the river, but he wasn't really running per se. He was kind of like hobbling around. I couldn't really understand why, but I remember what he was wearing. He was wearing like um, dark brown, like type khaki work pants and stuff and like a black leather type jacket. And I told dad, I was like, Hey, there's somebody out here on the riverbank uh, running around down on the property. And he came to look. And by that time, the old, the guy disappeared behind an old truck that was down there rotting away. Well, come to find out, shortly after this had happened, Dad told me of a situation he had where he was in the bathroom, actually, at the house when I wasn't there one evening, taking a shower. He came out of the shower, and here's this guy dressed just like that I would mentioned, um, standing with no feet in the bathroom as he opened up the shower curtain. And we found out later on that there was a gentleman back in 78, I believe it was, that had fallen asleep drunk on the uh, railroad tracks and a rent trainer ran by and cut his feet off out there and he bled mm. out and he died there on the property. And from what we understood, that was kind of what he was wearing that night when it happened. Well, then another real quick event, and then while we can move on, um, when I was about 11, my great-grandmother, who I was real, uh, real um, close with at that time, um, she passed away and we were going through the process of dealing with the estate and her home. We had the electric turned down in the house and it was actually, it's actually right behind us where we are right now. So we had to turn the electric off during the summer and you know how it is here in Appalachia spring, usually one or two o'clock in the day. It's not out of the realm of possibility. You get a storm that comes through. 
Right. Well, that day was one of those days. So we had to go over there and my grandmother and I had to walk over there to turn, make sure the windows were put down. We had to put them up in the morning, put them down for this storm. And she stayed downstairs and I went upstairs. And as I went upstairs, it was kind of a long, lengthy um, staircase that had a wall kind of dividing it from the upper floor to where you couldn't see anything till you got upstairs. And we got up to the upstairs and there was a rocking chair that sat in the corner up on the, this second floor. And I remember coming to the top of the stairs and having to stop because I looked and here was somebody sitting in that rocking chair. But the rocking chair was faced away from me. And it looked like an older lady who kind of resembled, especially from what I remembered, my great grandmother sitting there in this chair, just rocking. And as soon as I kind of really got a good look at who it was, it just kind of melted away. So those kind of things kind of really got me in that way. And then my dad and I have always been into it. And right around 2003, 2004 is when Ghost TV really kind of kicked off really yeah. heavily. And that's how I kind of got started. We started with a little three-man group where we went to a lot of the places around here and a lot of the places like Trans-Allegheny and uh, Moundsville and so on. Kind of got started through that. And had been kind of doing it on and off ever since, but really got kicked back into uh, high gear in 2020. One of the things that Teresa kind of mentioned on, for years, it was really hard to get involved in any kind of paranormal groups in the state of West Virginia. Right. They right. were locked down tight, and mm -hmm. they were not friendly to folks that they did not know and were not in their realm. Right. And it was tough to kind of get involved with established groups, and that's why we did our little three-manner. But then we tried to get involved with some of the bigger ones, and it just never worked. So we kind of petered out a little bit. But then 2020 came along and COVID, and everybody had to sit around at the house and be bored to death. And um, – the idea came to me once again. I'd been talking about doing it for years, and my wife, uh, uh, she and I talked about it, and she's like, why don't you do it? So I ended up starting this and met Teresa very shortly after that, and there we are. Nice. So how, I know how I met each one of you. I remember Teresa. I remember watching her uh, or following her page on Facebook, and I went to Sutton one day, and I walked in, and she's in the Sutton, the, uh, the Flatwoods Monster Museum, and I was like, hey, I was starstruck. I said, there's Teresa from, you know, from Teresa's Haunted History. So I said, <laughs> yeah, because we, you, I come up to you. And remember, I, I asked if I could take a picture with you. When uh, Yeah, that was yeah. fun. We were in town for the um, Small yeah. Town Monsters premiere. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. And uh, Brian, I believe I met you. Uh, it was at the Haunted at the Haven House. House. Right. Right. I, I, you guys invited me to come down or I stopped by. And I think that's how we met. So. Mm -hmm. With that being said, how, how now how did you all meet? You know, I mean, was it through uh, mutual friends? Was it through just, I mean, I, apparently the same interest in the same, you know, the subject, but as far as that, how did it really happen though? So Brian had started a Facebook page for spectral research and investigation, mm -hmm. and it just happened to pop up on my recommended. And I was like, hey, there's a, a group in, in Huntington. And I had, you know, previously left my group and I kind of toyed with the idea of starting my own group. Mm -hmm. um, I never really wanted the responsibility <laughs> of starting my own group. So I was like, hey, if this, you know, this, this group is starting, you know, that this might, you know, be a really good opportunity. So I mm -hmm. sent him a message and within the, you know, a couple of weeks we were, we were out investigating. At the TNT area. TNT area. That was our first so, one. So how I, doing the same thing you guys have done uh, for uh, quite a few years, how did you handle the uh, like trying to get investigations going, you know, approaching people or approaching locations uh, or did, did a lot of people approach you guys once you got your name out there? It's kind of a mixture, I would think, a little bit, Teresa. Um, we had to do a lot of groundwork initially, right? And then I, a lot I'm of lucky that yeah. I've, you know, that I I did work with Huntington Paranormal for yeah. almost, you know, 13 years. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of connections through that, and I had a lot of connections through my website, Teresa's Haunted History of the Tri-State, mm -hmm. and that's actually how we met Teresa Frame from the Haunted mm -hmm. Haven. Right. She and her um, niece Carrie had reached out to me about doing a feature 
on the house on my website. And that was our second investigation we nice. did. She invited us to come and check it out. Mm -hmm. It's a great location. Uh, we'll go into that here in a little bit, but I'm going to throw up one question here and see what, what you guys think. How many haunts or hunts or trips have you both done on an average? Is that an average per year or overall? Maybe, I, wonder. I, I say probably overall. Jesus. Um, Hundreds, if not more. Yeah. Um, probably every bit of it. We, we've we tended to average at least one good solid investigation a month. So, yeah. What's the ratio between like residentials and maybe well-known locations? What, what would you say the ratio to that would be? So back in the early days, and Teresa can attest to this as well, um, especially before SRI, I did more residentials. Mm -hmm. But in the litig or litigious climate that we live in and everybody wanting to sue everybody for everything, right. we have kind of trended away from those. We um, honestly have only since SRI started, we've only taken one residential and right. it was a uh, less. Is this PG or not? <laughs> it was yeah, it's, you're, you're good. It was this was, it, well, the residential we had was a shit show. Yeah. Um, it was a mess. Um, I don't go into a ton of detail on it because I'm sure the family's still out there trying to get help, quote unquote. Um, but long story short, because of the situations that you run into with like residentials, I remember mm -hmm. walking into places over the years um, with drugs laying out openly and um, child abuse scenarios, and yeah. physical or like domestic violence and stuff like that. And it just got to a point, especially here in the last two years, right before my little one was born, um, we had a person contact us from in-state who was trying to get us to come and help them out down near Williamson or somewhere down in Mango, or Mango County, Logan County, or somewhere like that. But what it ended up happening is from other knowledge and other groups I've contacted through some of our other uh, mutual friends in, the, in mm -hmm. the field, this person was actually luring people into their homes and stealing their information, like through, because apparently. She contacted you too, Les. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, because yeah. I actually. You know, I'm, like, I'm not doing it. Yeah, I contacted Teresa. I said, do you know this lady? Yes. She said, yeah, yes, yeah. I know who you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. Long story. It's honestly, while I understand the value of trying to help folks out and um, I would, I would love to do that more mm. given our position and like my position as like a state worker and things of that nature. I don't know necessarily if I want to put myself in that position too often. That's um, understandable. You never know what you're going to walk into. Um, yeah. Teresa, what do you got? Yeah, it's, you know, we, we are based out of Huntington and for a long time, Huntington has been well known for its drug issues. Yeah. And even back when I was with my old group, we had to stop doing residential investigations because it just got too dangerous. Right. Um, yeah. And even the ones that, you know, they aren't really that dangerous. A lot of times people who, you know, reach out with paranormal activity, they really don't want or even really need somebody to come in. They just want somebody to hear their story, tell them that they're not crazy, that everything's going to be okay, that, mm -hmm. hey, you know, we believe you, we've got your back. And a lot of times they're fine because a lot of times we'll go in and it's real hard, you know, especially because a lot of these places we only get one shot at, one, you know, yeah. one yeah. night to see what we can get. And, I mean, that that's really impossible to validate hardly yeah. anything with one day there um yeah. and so if you try to tell them well hey you know maybe this activity has this as a natural cause they tend mm. to get really kind of hostile with you right. yeah. and, and it is it's just it's a so emotionally draining because so many of these residentials we go in there might be paranormal activity there, mm -hmm. but it's overshadowed by, you know, the drug use, the mm -hmm. poverty, the, you know, physical, emotional abuse. And right. I mean, it's, it's, it's more being a social worker 
than it right. is being a paranormal yeah. investigator in a lot of these cases. Right. Yeah. yeah and and it, that's hard. You know, that's really hard to do. Uh, and you're talking about going into some of these places and you only have the one night, basically one night. Well, activity doesn't happen all the time. And and I've been in the same same situation where you go in some place and, you know, you get that one night to do it and you review the evidence. You don't catch anything. And just for a case, for, for an example, uh, I had a, a guy that was owned I mean, this large building and it's still it's still a vacant building in downtown Fairmont. And me and the, me and my team went in and we, we didn't catch a thing. But there was he was telling us that this happened, that that happens. And I told him, I was like, I said, buddy, I'm sorry. We didn't we didn't catch anything. I mean, if you would like for us to come back, try it again. And he was he was all right. Rate. He got upset and he's like, no, that, you know, I'm like, well, I'm sorry. We didn't catch anything. And I, I think that happens more, more than most people realize that, uh, you know, we're, we're there to try to help, but we, we can't always validate what you're, what you're experiencing. You know, I can't flip a switch on to make it work. Right. And we always try to, you know, preface that saying, you know, we, we, we can't, prove or disprove anything either way this yeah. is just one right. you know our professional opinion is based on the data that we have and yeah. speaking of, speaking of data and, and, and what you have uh, this little i think that was a piece of fuzz flying around it um <laughs> i was like well maybe it's a ghost i don't know and it's an orb data, yeah uh speaking of data that you have what what is your most what's the most interesting thing you've ever caught or seen or heard uh during an investigation I'll let you take that one first, Aaron. Oh, of course you would. <laughs> um, couple things kind of come to mind. Um, one, when I was originally starting out with my dad and uh, his friend, um, we did Trans Allegheny one evening, and this was very shortly after it opened up to any kind of like public activity. I think it's really close to when the Jordans opened it. We went and did a, this was really when they weren't really pushing the public tours too much. Mm -hmm. So we were in there and I think we were one of like three of 10 people that went to one of these public tours. We had one of the, we had the main building that night and most of the folks had left by right around 1130 or midnight. Most people don't stay past that point because I guess the novelty at that point to them wears off, but the three of us remained and two other people were there. We were up on the, I want to say it was the third floor where the access to the old kitchen was. And we were kind of standing there and it was pitch black because there was no renovations, nothing done at that time. This was like they opened the doors and they had one little room where you went to buy your tickets and they had a few little shirts and hats and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was so like primitive at that time compared to what it is now. And we were up there and we were staying in kind of at the crossroads at the end of the hallway up against one of those windows. And right to the right of us was the access to the kitchen cafeteria area. And at that time, that area was still blocked off. I think it still is to this day. I don't think they've opened that part up yet. Uh-oh, where's my buddy? Um, but as we were kind of standing there, we started hearing some folks, the two folks that were still remaining up above us, like start freaking out. And they were at the other end of the building. And you could hear them just start running. And right about that time, we were standing there and we were just trying to see if we could get anything to happen. And something, and I, I still don't know what it was, was able to be, something was pulled off of the wall or the ceiling and taken and thrown right past us and went right between the three of us and hit the wall underneath where the window was. Mm -hmm. And it, I, we could feel it come past us. That's the thing that was crazy about it is it wasn't falling from the ceiling. If that'd be easy enough to kind of explain, because you know where that movement's coming from. This whizzed by. So something was apparently frustrated enough with us to push something right by us. So that was one. And we tried and tried and tried to figure out what that was. And we tried to figure out where it had come from. And if it was like a ceiling tile or whatever, and we couldn't get an explanation. 
Now, the other one, and I don't know if I'm infringing on Teresa here because I, I think Teresa and I are on the same level with this one, was down in our buddies down in Beckley at um, the Deep End Antiques. Right. Teresa, were you going to use this one? Because I can get tell a story. I can tell yeah, my side right. later if I need to. Well, you can just add on to it. How about that? All right. Um, so we went to the Beckley um, Oddities Fair, mm -hmm. and I think what was that, Teresa? Was that 2022? Uh, it's been several years ago. Yeah. It's 2021 or 2022. Yeah. We were invited to come down with by Scott Worley to come to this Oddities Fair, and we set up our table and stuff there, and one of our members at the time, Brian Martin, suggested that we uh, go right across next to us was this guy from Deep End Antiques in Beckley, mm -hmm. West Virginia. Well, we did. Well, I kind of talked to him for a little bit. And he said, yeah, come on over. And he kind of gave us a little bit of insight about just like some of the things that they reported, but nothing else. So he wasn't really right. in detail. So we called him like, I want to say like a day or two later. And we all, well, Teresa and I talked to Travis for probably close to an hour about some of the history and reports of the location and so on. And we set it up and we went to go check it out. And we had been there shortly after um, JJ and Scott had been there from West Virginia Paranormal. Right. So we go down there and it's this nondescript little location. It, like when I pulled up, I'm like, really? This is, this is it. This is what mm -hmm. I'm doing. Um, it's a pole barn structure, metal pole barn structure. Hey, Seamus. Um, it's a new construction, and it sits right in front of what looks like an old, old hotel, which it was. And it looked like there were buildings of it that were, had fallen down and been burnt down and destroyed and stuff. And it was like, there's something not quite right here. So we go in, we um, start investigating. We have a lot of early on things happen. And we go back in the building. And he, it's kind of separated into three rooms. There's a front room, a back room, and uh, his office. We go in. Were you going to take him? Yeah. All right. Um, we go in, and there is this back room has a lot of stuff scattered all over. We go in, and he sets it up to where he says, there's a lot of things that happen in here. If you are having trouble finding anything, check the mirrors. Okay. Right. So we go back to this back room, and there's two accesses to the ceiling that I see up there, and I just ask him generally, I think, if he had storage or anything up there, but I think they were just accesses to, like, heating system, and that was it. So he said, but there is something up there. He said, it's my critter. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. said, yeah, I've got a little buddy that lives up there. And I'm like, what the hell are you right. talking about? Well, he said, well, I've got this creature that lives here with me that it's a family kind of deal, and it's called the Ovnik. I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? I'm Whatever. I thought he was crazy. Or I, and he said, yeah, um, if you want to see it, I can try to let you see it. And he puts me in front of this mirror and stands me there, and he says, um, just stand here for a little bit. And he leaves, and James and Brian Martin are in there with us, and they're kind of going through some boxes in the back behind me. And they're looking at all this stuff he had. And he has some um, coat racks with like old NASCAR jackets and stuff like that on it. And he looks down and he leaves. And these two guys are rummaging through this stuff. And I'm standing here in front of this mirror like an idiot for three or four minutes. Nothing happening. And all of a sudden, out of the right hand of my vision... I'm starting to see some movement and it's coming from up above Brian and James. And I'm looking and I'm like, what the hell is that? And then I look in into it a little bit closer and what I see kind of resembles like a cat or mm -hmm. like something of that nature standing up on the top of this coat rack, looking at these two guys behind me. Like, what is that? And I start to turn around and as I'd like kind of lock eyes on it, it bolts, it jumps down, and it bolts its little ass across this room as fast as it can, 
and like darts underneath this big chinette cabinet. He has a bunch of glass and stuff on. And I try to go follow it to see where it went. And I know approximately where it went. And I went to look underneath it and it was not there. Saw it again a little bit later. Brian Martin was going into this office where he has his like spiders and stuff. And I am looking at a big display case that he has. I'm checking one of our cameras. We have an IR camera set up. And it had died or something like that. We, I think it was one that we borrowed from Scott, and it died. So I was trying to figure it out, and I just happened to turn around. And here's this little critter, once again, standing up on two legs, standing on a stack of 45 records, looking at Brian Martin like, hmm. who are you? What are you doing there? And it saw me, I guess, look at it, and it just went like this. It just, it just like, like it imploded upon itself. So, Teresa, now you can add to that. <laughs> so, I was also lucky enough to see this little creature that night, too. So, while all of that was going on, I was actually outside in one of the motel rooms with a small group. Right. And our group comes in, and the other Brian pulls me aside, and he's, like, real excited. And he's like, Teresa, Travis has this little monkey thing in the back. And so, I'm like what because <laughs> at first like my, my brain's trying to process this and you know travis collects spiders he had his dog with him there for part of the evening i thought he had an actual pet monkey back there and nobody had told me and i was really upset because i wanted to go see and play with the monkey he's like no 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 he called it an omnic it's like you know this this house spirit family spirit and i'm like what? Because <laughs> we, we came into this investigation, you know, knowing that it was on the site of this old hotel where all this tragedy had occurred. So we were kind of looking at this from the angle of, OK, we're going to deal with stuff that's attached to the land, maybe, plus all of the antiques in here, because some of the mm -hmm. antiques, you know, did have stories attached to them. We uh, we weren't really prepared for a Slavic familial house spirit. Um so Travis, you know, came over and he's like, well, do you want to see it? I was like, well, uh, yeah, absolutely. I want to see this. So while he and everybody else stayed in the main room um, and he was telling a story about his haunted hat that he has, um, I sat in the other, the back room by myself. And he, you know, he told me the same thing. He's like, well, you know, kind of look at the mirrors and everything. So I'm sitting there on the couch back there. And at one point, I kind of feel like it feels like maybe like a, a very light, small cat jumps up on the couch behind me. And of course, there's nothing there. A couple other times, I kind of saw a little bit of shadow movement out of my eyes, but nothing that I could be like, oh, yeah, that was definitely something. So Travis ends up, he finishes telling the story about the hat and comes back in there to where I am. And he's like, have you seen it yet? And I'm like, oh, you know, I may have seen something. I'm not really sure. I don't think so. And he's like, it's right there. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> so he points to the office and I come over and stand beside of him. And we're kind of standing there looking from the back room into the office. And there is a large Rubbermaid tote just full of stuff. And peeking out of this, I see a pair of green eyes, like two little black ears that look exactly like cat ears. And I even see one little white, you know, kind of tooth. And I'm staring at this thing and staring at it. We're getting closer and closer. And it blinks at me. And I can see the eyes shut and the eyes open back up. And so I'm having like an existential crisis because this, this should not be. This is not anything, even as a paranormal investigator, I, you know, thought about. Right. Um, and so we get right up to the tote. And Travis goes to reach towards it. And like Brian said, the thing just went shoop and just disappeared. And it was funny, he, like Travis was teasing me afterwards and he's like, well, why didn't you have your camera out? Why weren't you filming that? And I was like, man, I couldn't even tell you, you know, what my name was, where I was. I was just concentrating on this thing, trying to make sense of what it was. Mm -hmm. When you say disappeared, are you mean like, is it just like dematerialized or, or what do you mean? I don't even know how to describe it other than it literally went swoop. <laughs> I mean, it. It's like it got sucked out of the room. Like, yeah, each time it didn't thought, like fade like, or anything. It literally swooped. <laughs> like, like, it was grabbed from like, another dimension and just ripped back. Yeah. Okay. But it didn't like, ex I don't know how to explain what I'm trying to say. So you, when you, you both went down, 
Does it? Do you yeah. mean did it look like it went down through something, or when it went yeah. down, it just like dissipated, or or you mean it just like it went through into something? You know, dropped dropped into like maybe another another realm or 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 portal. That's like, how portal my mind kind of sees it. Yeah. Like it was just it fell through like another realm. Yeah, like I said like it it didn't fade away. Um, it wasn't gradual. It was literally swoop. <laughs> And he has a weird way of showing himself sometimes because we've seen him multiple times. And sometimes he's very clear. And there's sometimes that he kind of reminds you of like a dark television static that you can kind of mm. roughly see his outline. And he's there for a little bit and he'll kind of like poke out from behind things and kind of look at you for a moment. And then it'll just, it'll just like, he goes like, gets pulled wherever he is going. And it's almost like at times he can like jump from one spot to another, just like he's here. Next right. thing you know, he's over here and you can almost oh, like track, track where, he's where he's going, but you can't get a hundred percent certainty yeah. of where he's going to pop up. So it, it was it pronounced Avik or Avik? How's it pronounced? Avnik. Avik? Okay. Avnik. Avnik. Okay. Yeah. And how did you learn about the background? you know, the history of what this thing could have been. Did, did Travis tell you or do you guys look into it? Travis explained it pretty well. And then I did a little bit more digging, to, you know, just yeah. know. Is it something that's from way back or is it relatively new or, I mean, I'm sure it's something. The way, the way he explained it was it's something that is kind of like a fair family possession. Okay. Um, he described that his family had come over during the late 1800s as kind of indentured servants in the mines. Okay. And they came over from Slovenia, Slovakia, and that region of kind of Europe. And since it's one of those old Slavic legends, it's one of something that kind of followed with his family. And his family talked about it. And he said that he recalled seeing it even when he was little. I mm -hmm. uh, kind of had experiences with it back in the day. He said it kind of offers kind of a sense of protection to him and to his possessions and to his, okay. um, his property that he runs. Um, he's talked about it having like involvement with people that he is like friends with and stuff like that as well. Okay. So he kind of explained it as like a family heirloom of sorts that kind of got passed along to him. And then he's kind of had it and it will follow him from home, but it also has a presence at his work all the time. He's talked about people that will steal from him down there. And he's, he's been very candid. He will talk about like how people will steal from him in that shop. And then they will bring the items back in a heartbeat and bring mm -hmm. them back to him because they talk about like seeing this black cat shape and like, having bad experiences after they steal from him that he attributes to this thing's kind of involvement. Um, and some of the other things that are at deep end antiques kind of don't seem to be all that fond of it either, Teresa. Yeah, there is, um, there's a lot of interesting things in that one little location. Um, it, it is absolutely an area of high strangeness it's not just ghosts and hauntings right. i mean it and even that like the history of that location goes back before even the civil war there was a civil war area in that area um activity in that area there's mining disaster happened right there in that area um geologically it's at a major crossroads plus a crossroads of like two or three different like little streams I mean, it's just, it's like a hotbed of activity, but my, like it's in Beckley and my grandparents, you know, were from Beckley and mm -hmm. that whole area through there, haven't heard any Bigfoot sightings <laughs> in that immediate area, but there's a lot of UFO sightings in right. that right there. Um, now when he described it or told you about this thing, uh, I'm just going to back up a little bit. Did he, did he say like, it's something spiritual or is it more something like in the fae side of things or, or i would or, say more fey like it's it's like yeah. a, a brownie it's it's really okay. like a family house spirit um okay. like back you know in europe these things were known to protect the the silo or the granary and right. if you if it was happy with you it would protect your crop. It would protect your grain. If you made it mad, it would burn your silo down. It would burn your house down. Um, 
So it, it very much fae like, very trickster like, very one minute it can be protective, the next minute it can screw you over if it feels wrong. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I I got that. I don't know if I want to. I don't want to know if I want one of those in my house though. But I I got it. Um. So Just what? Some uh, pancakes and some fried chicken every once in a while, and it's fine. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I yeah. was going to ask you. That's another question. Right? Did he say if there's a way to that he does to pay tribute to it in any way or anything like that? Or does he offer it, you know, treats? I mean, I mean, you see the movies where they where they have brownies or something and they'll give them they'd like the one. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the movie now, but they gave it crackers and honey. Does he do anything like that with this thing? He or? does salt pretty heavily. And then he does like pancakes for it on occasion. Okay. Um he puts out offerings of salt for it. And that's kind of funny because we were in there one evening and we had uh, our spirit box out and we were kind of hearing the word salt over and over and over again. And he put some salt out for it. And Teresa, I don't, I think, I don't think I heard it, but Teresa like swears up and down. Like she hears like they were like, they heard this like squeal of like, it was like a happy squeal. Yeah. It was like, I don't know. A happy squeal. That that thing made a sound. Is what you mean, or apparently because it didn't. The way they described it, and Teresa, I could be wrong on this, but the way you kind of associated with it, it didn't sound like it came from the radio. Yeah, it, it definitely sounded animalistic, like it, like it, like it was kind of maybe like a mouse or something. Yeah. But it was it, it it sounded joyous. It was like ee, like it it chittered. Mm. I guess would be a good way. It chittered. Yeah. That's, that's pretty wild. So, okay, let's jump over into, since we, we talked about a little bit ago, uh, the Haunted Heyman House. Uh, I've been there a few times. I know you guys have been there a few times, and Teresa's a great host. Uh, so if anybody wants to to check that place out, you, you need to look into it. it it's, it's in downtown Sutton. Uh, when was it built? 1890? 1893. Right? 90, it's 1890-something, I remember right. A uh, lot of history there. It's uh, one of the original, um, I guess you'd say, a tycoon in, in a way. Uh, he was a lumber tycoon. Then he was a lawyer. Then he was, um, I guess he went into politics, if I'm right. Am I, am I mm -hmm. correct with that? Um, but, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a crazy house or a crazy location. So, uh, but I've had a few things happen to me there. And it, it's always a fun time going back. And I, like I said, that's where I first met Brian and, and and hung out with you guys there. What what is something there that's uh, that's happened there that you that's that's very memorable for you? Brian had a really memorable experience there. Uh huh. Um, Do you want to talk about it or? <laughs> Honestly, I have still not been a hundred percent sure what the hell happened that night. Um, we got there. When was that, Teresa? Was that that wasn't last year? It was a year before. It was twenty twenty two. We went. I don't know. We've that, investigated there so many times. I'm not exactly sure when this one was. I think it was summer of twenty twenty two. Um, we spent a weekend there, and the plan was that we were going to do a tour for Teresa one night to help her. Um, advertise and bring some finances in and stuff like that. The second night we were going to be there kind of operating on our own. So we did a tour the first night. Um, we had, I think, 17 or 18 guests come join us. We kind of walked around in parties and stuff like that and kind of went over some of the basics and showed people equipment and kind of went over some of the stories and things of that, of that nature. And I remember the first night we knew it was different because we had a couple things happen that were different for us than we had had before. Um, one situation we had came up. Um, Vanessa from um, Dark Hollow Paranormal was there with mm -hmm. us. She helped us that night, and she was leading a party, and I was leading a party with Teresa. And we had walkie-talkies between the two of us, and we were kind of working on different floors. And I remember that we... My group was in the basement. We started downstairs. We didn't really have anything happen down there. So we came up to the sitting room and kind of sat down and kind of took a break, used the restroom and things of that nature. And as we are in that room, 
we I put down my walkie-talkie on the table in front of Teresa. And I remember telling Teresa, I'm going to go use a restroom if Vanessa needs us or anything like that. And here's the walkie so she could get a hold of. And as I'm walking away, we hear a voice come over the radio that I'll mm-hmm. swear Teresa swore and everybody that was there swore was Vanessa's voice saying, hello, hello. Mm-hmm. And it made us stop for a minute. And then I walked back over to the radio and I think Teresa picked it up. It's like, uh, Teresa uh, or uh, Vanessa, are you, is that you? And nothing, nothing. She sounded in distress. Like yeah. something was really wrong. And so it took a minute. And then she like said, yeah, go for Vanessa. And we were like, did you call for us? Are you okay? And she said, yeah, um, what's going on? And we said, we just heard a voice that sounded like you, that sounded like there was something going on. She said, well, we heard the same voice upstairs. On the and radio? Tried, yeah, it was, and through her radio, too. So okay. it sounded like I would be hesitant to say it was somebody working at Sutton Dam. Right. I mean, I guess there's always a possibility of that considering the distance and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But it sounded the thing. The thing that was really weird about it, it sounded just like her, and right. it sounded like a person in distress that made us think that there was something going on upstairs that we needed to draw our attention to. Well, she came down and said that they heard the same video and or the same audio and stuff like that that we did, and couldn't really figure out what it was. But I remember she took her group out downstairs, and I was standing in front of a table that we had all of our equipment on. And as I'm standing there, and it is almost black at this point, somebody walks, it seems like somebody walks up to the table. We have all our EMF detectors in a row laying on the table. And every single one of them pinged like somebody slammed their hand on the table at one time. Every one of them went all the way up and then dropped all the way out. None of us Mm -hmm. had our cell phones or anything like that around it. I don't know what it was, but that was something that was really odd. And we had a lot of interaction through uh, blind box method and stuff like that that we right. hadn't really had there before. So we knew something was kind of off. But after the public left, it kind of got kind of quiet. We were all tired. And I think we all went to bed like 1.30 or 2 that night because we were all wiped mm. out. And it was calm till the next night. Now, right. when we're in there alone, we start getting busy and stuff like that. And almost immediately, it goes freaking haywire in there in a way that we had never seen in that building. And we tried to figure out what has caused a lot of this. And we haven't been able to reasonably assume what caused this. But we have a couple good guesses, but I'm not going to mention them on the air for obvious reasons. But... I don't know if somebody else came into that house that has never been there before or was stirred up by some kind of activity prior to us being there. But we had a lot of situations where there seemed to be a female spirit that showed up in the house that night that was not Emma, was not somebody that we had run into in the past, someone that was very interactive, and was pretty freaking hostile. Yeah. Um, most of the activity kind of centered in the mid to late evening after Teresa did an Estes Method session up on the stairs going to the third floor. Right. Teresa, do you want to tell, before yeah. I go any further, mm-hmm. what happened? Okay, so we could definitely tell that the atmosphere had changed during that trip, you know, from previous trips that we've been there. Um, I have always kind of felt this connection with Emma, Mr. Heyman's uh, first wife who died in the Mm -hmm. house. Um, I have seen her. I have heard her. Um, I feel like she's she's there watching the house, kind of taking care of things um, and has reached out and communicated with me a couple of times. But at one point in the evening, I had seen somebody on the staircase between the second floor and the third floor. Um, that was not Emma. It mm-hmm. was a girl with dark, dark hair. 
So I was like, you know, we decided, okay, well, you know, let's do the S's method. I was like, well, I want to do it right there where I saw this girl because I don't know who she was. She was not Emma and she did not look happy. So we st- that's where we started the Estes method as we started it there on the staircase. Mm-hmm. And between the stuff that was coming through and a lot of that, Brian will have to help fill in because I don't remember. I was completely in the zone. I was actually having a lot of like vision type things of this girl um, with thick, dark chestnut colored hair with a red top on. And she was so, so angry. And I kept visioning her in um, the bathroom, uh, just angrily, like, brushing her hair, like, violently brushing her hair. Um, And I don't know exactly what I was telling them. I know, I think the the dousing rods came out, too. And something told us, though, that we needed to go from that third floor up into Mr. Heyman's office. So that's where we ended up. So while Teresa was under, we were running dowsing rods and stuff like that and using Mm -hmm. EMF detectors and such. And there were several of us that we were able to track like energy levels moving in a circle on that second floor from the green room to the blue room, across the hallway, through that little hallway and back around. And it moved in a circular pattern. And at one point, I think Casey had the dowsing rods out and she asked, do you want us to go upstairs? And right around the same time, Teresa said something about going upstairs and the dowsing rods clicked at the same time to indicate going upstairs. So we went upstairs to his office and kind of settled in. And we were under the assumption since Teresa was having a lot of progress, we were going to try to put her back under. So we did. And she started kind of mentioning things that seemed to make sense in the location. She mentioned a going into a room Mm -hmm. with green uh, with a chair that was like greenish color with brass like accents and stuff like that which is that chair that is in that one room Mm -hmm. um and she mentioned that under and we were asking questions and the dowsing rods were going crazy at this point the emf detectors were going crazy and we asked the question about, do you want us to go to that room? Because it seemed to indicate that it wanted us to go over to that room where the chair was. And I said, yes. So I got up and I went over there and the rest of them stayed in that room. And I have a camera rolling this whole time. And I go into the bathroom or the makeshift bathroom of stairs, take that for what you go. And I go in and I sit down on that lip where the bathtub sits Mm-hmm. And I oh, before up. this, when he gets to like to the room, he can hear me in the other room saying "knock first. Yes, I. It, she said "knock first, so I knocked on the door and I went on in, and I sit down on this lip, and it mm-hmm. is almost pitch black in there. Right. And I'm sitting down, and I have my uh, phone recording just video right now, but at that time it is pitch black, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking down. And I just happened to look up and I can see that chair, just the faintest outline of that chair sitting over there. And I see something else too. And it looks like somebody actually sitting in that chair. It looks kind of like a rough visual of maybe like a person sitting there, but I can't get a full like silhouette. So I'm not entirely certain. But as soon as I look at it, something like hits me. That is like pure electricity. It Mm. starts at my feet and works all the way up my body. And when it hits my core, I can feel my arms restrict. I can feel my shoulders restrict. And I just want to go into like this, like Lazarus position. I just hold on for dear life. And it hurts so damn bad. It feels like I'm getting hit with like, uh, like a hundred or shoot a hundred volts or something like that. It was heavy enough. And I work on like antique electronics and stuff like that. And I've been electrocuted more times than I care to admit. And it felt just like getting electrocuted to a high degree. And I'm yelling and they come over. A couple of them come over. Teresa's still under at this point, I think. So we have Dan, one of our sound men, and Austin, who was with us that night. They come over there to that room where I'm at. And they 
put EMF detectors and, and uh, voltmeters on me. And they are getting like 70, 80, 90 volts of electricity off of my body hmm. as this is happening. And I'm just sitting there in this kind of feeling, and they're asking me questions, and I start to kind of feel it subside, and it just feels like it starts in my head and just kind of works its way down, and it comes down off of me. And then for a few minutes there, I just like, it hurts so damn bad, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And they are like, they are able, and they took video of this thing like peaking on their extremely like high levels of this electricity coming off of me for no reason. They pull me out of that room and they say, hey, uh, let's get you out of here and let's take you over back over to his office. I don't know what caused that one. So we go back in the other room and we rouse Teresa back out of the, uh, the Estes method. And we kind of let her know what is going on. And we're, and we're sitting, sitting there. there. And Casey's continuing to run dowsing rods and asking some questions. And this about probably 30, 45 minutes passes and nothing, nothing. And then we start, start hearing some sounds and start hearing some things happening. And they ask if, I guess I volunteered to go under. So I did and I went under and I'm sitting there and it doesn't take me very long to kind of go under at this point. And I remembered feeling like somebody walking up the stairs to that room. And I remembered feeling like the floor started to move underneath me. And it felt like almost when somebody comes up and you're sitting on the floor and somebody stands right in front of you and you can mm. kind of feel the floor sag. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. There's somebody right here with me. Right about that same time, that electric hit again. And Man, it was wicked that, that time again. And they're watching this all unfold. And I know like... Dan, our audio man, who'd never been through any of this kind of stuff, he was like, he was ready to leave the damn house that night. I'm surprised we actually got him to stay. And he's in medical. He's like, he's training to be a doctor. And he is really, like, concerned about staying there all evening. This hits for a while, and it hurts once again. It's like one of those moments where it just feels like you have no control whatsoever. And I just felt like I felt this woman standing right in front of me, just screaming at the top of her lungs at me. And I don't know what the hell, like, what was her problem? But when I came out of it, they took me outside and they put me on the porch. And we sat out there and talked for a long time. And we came back in the house. And at this point, it's getting late and everybody's tired. And I, I, I'm seeing some stuff in, like, our group. And even for me, to some degree, I'm like, I don't know if we need to stay here tonight. Because this is not normal for this house. So we go back in. And from the inset, when you go in there and you see that staircase, you can look up and see the second floor. Mm -hmm. and it's all black, but I feel like that woman is standing up there on the second floor kind of looking down. Like just pissed, just daring us. And we kind of talk and we finally say, you know what? We're going to try to make amends. And we go up to the second floor, all of us as a team. And we just kind of sit down and just kind of relax and just kind of like try to talk to her or whoever it is and kind of try to calm this and put it at ease. And all the time I'm, I'm sitting there and I stand up at one point and I go over to the second floor to the railing, looking up to the third floor. And I can feel like her looking down at me, just, just scowling, just pissed at me. And I remember, and it was kind of vague because I don't have a ton of recollection about what happens next because I don't know if it was just like that flight or flight mechanism. But I remember on camera watching myself standing there at the rail and Teresa and them all talked about this afterwards. They all watched me back up. And I backed up all the way to the end of that hallway on the second floor and got right up against that window and kind of tucked myself into the corner. And I talked to her, I was like, guys, she's coming down. And I could feel her coming down. Well, that's when Teresa kind of gets involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he, I mean, he's right. You can actually feel this energy, this entity, whatever it is, getting closer. 
And I was like, well, you know, she, she has no beef with me because th throughout these, these Estes methods and through the communication, she was making it very clear that for whatever reason, Brian reminded her of somebody that she did not like and she did not want him around there. She, she did not like him. So I was afraid because I could feel her coming down the stairs and I was like, well, she's going to go after him again. And so I jumped up and kind of, you know, I was going to like, you know, try to block her because I was like, well, she's, you know, she has no beef with me. And I felt that like in my head, she, she got to me and I could hear her kind of say, my issue is not with you. Mm -hmm. And as she pushed past me, like I lost all strength and I just kind of like crumbled against the wall. And I was like, "Oh crap! <laughs> she she's not happy." Um, do do you th do you think you may have intervened at that point because mm -hmm. that's when they all heard the scream? I yeah. was about to ask you. I was that just come. I was that was ready to come out of my out of my of the mouth there. Do you think this is the same spirit that, that the screams have been heard? You know, like JJ's caught them. You've heard them. I've heard it. Do you mm -hmm. think that's the same spirit, or do you think the scream is something? something that different or something else, maybe like you were about to say, maybe a protection or something, maybe. So what my theory was, and I don't know if Brian agrees, I think maybe he kind of does. At, at the time we felt that scream came from Emma telling okay. whoever this girl was, I've had enough of your garbage. You're not going to treat my guests this way. This is not how we act in this house. And she had that frustrated scream and it was like, whatever the the angry girl was she was she was gone okay so i remember like standing there in that doorway and i like just i tucked up against that corner because i knew and i watched Teresa like fold like a lawn chair go down on the floor and i'm like oh shit because and everybody else i can see ever all of our other folks are sitting there on that little bench or on that couch there on the second floor landing mm -hmm. and they're all like wide-eyed like oh hell what do we do here and i remember like just kind of looking out of my peripheral before that scream happens and i just get this faint like sensation or feeling and i look to my left and i can just see just like a white mist or something like that in the doorway to the pink room and as soon as i see that i hear that scream we all hear that scream and I just feel like the energy just kind of got sucked back out of there. And then we were sitting there like trying to recollect ourselves, like what in the world was that? And we heard it again upstairs, but I like the second time it was different. And it was almost like, it was like this girl or whatever like that. She's upstairs. She's throwing a damn temper, temper tantrum that she did not get her way. And it was real quick and it was distant. It was a distant one. It wasn't like, the one we heard initially seemed like it was in that area with us. The second time, it did not seem the same way. And after that, the energy seemed like it got calm again. But I'm freaking exhausted. Teresa's freaking exhausted. Dan is scared out of his mind. He's trying to get Casey to leave. Um, we have got like numerous folks that are like deeply concerned about staying in the house that night. So we go back downstairs and we're just trying to like recollect ourselves. And I remember looking back at some of the video afterwards and just seeing like this look at like dejectedness or just like we had just got done uh, fighting 10 rounds uh, with Muhammad Ali or something. Every one of us looked like we had just been beaten to pieces that night. And we finally decided we talked to Dan and we kind of that settled him down a little bit. And we went through and we went up to the second floor and we did some saging and stuff like that just to kind of make sure that we calmed some of this energy down. Just to kind and we I even remember putting the sage in Dan and Casey's room just so Dan would sleep in the building that night because I thought he was going to leave her there with us that morning. And we um, all left our doors wide open that night too. And I remember we all went in and I slept in the blue room that night. And I remember mm. being out within a matter of seconds uh, and just complete calm. Don't remember yeah. anything after that point. But I had something happen, yeah. though, after that yes, point. Yes, you did afterwards because I was dead. I didn't know. 
So I I couldn't sleep. I was still wide awake after all this stuff was going on, even though I was physically exhausted, mentally exhausted. So I'm kind of laying there. Like I said, we have all of our doors open and I'm in the room that adjoins where Brian is. So I can kind of make sure if something happens, you know, I can run over there real quick through the bathroom. Um, so I'm laying there and it's pitch dark in there. And I'm trying to go to sleep and I've got, you know, the door open and stuff. So I'm right there about the staircase and I'm laying in bed and I'm trying to like, you know, fall asleep. And I hear what sounds like somebody packing up a suitcase real quick, dragging that suitcase down the stairs and opening that front door and closing the front door. Yeah. And we, we've had the front door actually physically open on us a couple of times. So I was like, oh, my God, who panicked and left? <laughs> so I like ran downstairs real quick to be like, yeah, it's, it's OK. You know, it would make sure you get home. OK, if you're leaving. And, you know, nobody, of course, was down there and everybody else was asleep. I asked and nobody else had heard this except for me. That was one and of I the first back at the cameras. I looked at Teresa's cameras the morning after and couldn't find any of that. Like nothing. That was one of the first things I had. Well, I've had a couple of experiences there prior for uh, prior to me staying there. But the first time I stayed there, I stayed there alone. I was there by myself. And that was one thing that I did experience. I was this is back when before she had the couches and, and the furniture in there. She just had an old futon in, in the, uh, the setting room there. And I was I was like, yeah, I'm going to lay down. I'm going to go sleep. And I. I laid on the futon mattress and I had my camera in the hallway pointing up to the stairs. I had it sitting on any to motion or anything like that. But during the middle of the night, I forget what, what time it was. It had to be like 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. I hear something that sounds like like you talk about something being drug across the, the hallway upstairs on the second floor. Uh, it didn't come down the stairs, but it, it just sounded like a piece of furniture or, you know, now that you mentioned a trunk or something like being drug along. And it, it actually woke me up. And so that's that's pretty cool that that uh, kind of validates something I experienced there as well. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, we got a couple uh, question here, if you guys don't mind, unless you, you guys got something else you want to share about that or we'll go to question, a couple questions. Okay. Yeah, questions. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. Real quick. Would you prefer a house or a bigger ha- building, school, church, hospital, et cetera? They all have their own kind of um, uniqueness to them. Um, the houses, if because we've got a fairly large group when we deploy everybody, uh, we have eight to ten people. Um, so a house kind of becomes a little bit problematic for like bleed over and things of that nature. So a, a larger location kind of fits the size of our group a little bit more. Um, but I love doing like the Heyman house. I love doing... We had the Ross house not too long ago, which was fun, although it was hellacious there that night, too. Um, I think the thing about it for me is more than anything, I'm just a junkie for, like, historic architecture and historic buildings and stuff in general. I just love looking at them. I love getting the ambiance of them. I like going and looking close at some of the details that might otherwise be overlooked, like the Heyman house, the wall, uh, the wall panels with that little distinct uh, candle, which we make all kinds of obscene jokes about because if right. you look at it close, it looks like something yeah. else. Um, yeah. Those kind of things, yeah, those kind of things are kind of appealing too. But I'm just, I just enjoy more i think as almost as much as the uh, paranormal side i love checking out the cool old structures yeah. and kind of getting a feel for them and what they bring to the table on top of whatever might be there what about you teresa yeah i just i love any place with a good history um so you know i, I love both equally I, I love going to these bigger locations um i yeah I do like the locations, though. I know that's not the question, but I like the locations that haven't been investigated yeah. over and over and over yeah. again. Um, I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I do like the the obscure or ones that's not doesn't have the, the, the fame or whatever to them attached to them. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Okay, let me see what we got here. Another one. 
Uh, what is the longest investigation? I, mean, well, I assume what that you've you've all done. Well, Heyman House one that we just talked about was over the course of two days. So that was. Yeah. I mean, we we yeah, have locations that we are lucky enough to have access to mm -hmm. pretty much anytime we want to. So, so yeah. some of our stuff we consider ongoing, like deep end right. antiques. Travis right. will let us yeah. down there anytime we want. So that's always yeah. an ongoing thing. Yeah. I think the longest one I've been involved in is two days kind of consistently. Um, I'd love to do one longer, but scheduling makes that kind of difficult. We've talked about doing the Octagon House up in Circleville, Ohio for a weekend this year if we have the opportunity. Um, that gives you enough time to kind of get acclimated to the location, kind of let them get acclimated to you, kind of get an idea of what you're going to contend with over a period of time rather than basically getting – six good hours of investigation in before you get exhausted right? and I have to get ready to drive out the next day, that gives you the ability to say, okay, I'm going to rest for a bit. And then I even during the day, you can do investigation during the day, during the night and kind of break it up over a period of time. I think that's one of the more fun parts of it is especially when you can kind of bring it into a whole bigger picture rather than just one little snippet of a night. Right. And I and I've noticed, you know, when, when I've done investigations in the past, it seems like I don't know if it's just me, but like the first two to three hours in, in some locations seems extremely active. I don't know if it's because whatever's there, maybe I'm just excited to see you as you are to get me in there. And then it I don't know, or maybe just because of the energy that everybody's putting off feeds that. And then when you you know, the night goes on, you get tired and your energy lacks. Um, and, you know, activity seems to kind of wane a little bit. And I'm, what do you, what do you think about that? You think maybe our energy can feed some of these, these, these uh, hauntings, I guess you'd say. I definitely kind of say so. I'm sure probably Teresa can attest to this yeah, as well. Absolutely, just, because I mean, over yeah. the years we've investigated some locations and we've seen, the type of activity mm -hmm. completely change mm -hmm. over a course of time. And I think that a lot of it is because of the energy all these people, are, you know, that come visit this place are bringing in. Um, right. But yeah, like, you know, what you're talking about, things being active at the beginning, that's a good tip for newbie investigators. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have your cameras and your recorders on as soon as you step on that property because yeah. you're going to miss some. Yeah, Good not dinner. inside, not inside. As soon as you pull up, because I mean, I've I've caught stuff, you know, getting out of the car. You, I've caught EVPs just getting out of the car, walking to a, to locations. So <laughs> it's not always inside, you know. Yeah, as yeah, soon all, as you get there. Yeah, we we like yeah. to film us like pulling up on location and stuff, so we Absolutely. usually have something running. Absolutely. Well, I want to say thank you to both of you for coming on. Uh, Absolutely. Keep me updated for what uh, with whatever you guys are doing. Uh, we I'll got one it. coming up this weekend. Oh, awesome. We're at. Tell a little bit about it, Teresa, because I've never been there. You've been there. So um, it's bit. the Campbell Flanagan Mural House Museum in Hinton, West Virginia. Um, it's, this, it's a three story house. It's now a museum. Um, was built by um, Mr. Campbell, Edward Campbell, I think. He was one of the first, uh, he, he operated a general store on the ground floor. Um, the house was built in 1875. It looks like a really large salt box house. Um, beautiful, right on Summer Street in Hinton um, in front of the railroad. And it stayed in the same family up through at least 1986. Mm -hmm. Nice. So there's a lot of railroad history there. Um, the second owner um, was a railroad man who passed away in a railroad accident a couple of miles outside of town. So we're really looking forward. We we are the third team that has investigated this location. Nice. And uh, where can people find you? You know, as far as your social media, uh, if they need to talk to you about something, you know, maybe they need to share an experience with you. Where can they find you? Mm -hmm. Teresa, you start because you got the blog that everybody goes to. <laughs> um, well, if you just want to, you know, share a spooky or haunted location or some 40 in history from West Virginia, I'd love to hear it um, at Teresa's Haunted History of the Tri-State. I have the blog where I try to curate all of these spooky stories um, about West Virginia and beyond. 
Um, you can find me on all the social medias. I'm on YouTube, um, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, all that stuff. Um, and Brian can tell us about the, the SRI pages. We're on all the socials there, too. Yeah. Yeah, so SRI is on Facebook, TikTok, um, Instagram, and several of the others. Um, we have a website, but it, it is preparing, I think, to go under renovations. I know Leela was talking about wanting to re renovate it, which is great. Um, because I just don't have time to mess with it, and I'm not great with uh, tech as it is. But we're gonna we have SRI Huntington WV, which you can access a lot of our previous investigations, galleries, um, important stuff from there as well. Um, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that under my name. You can find me on TikTok under Brian Clary 81 as listed as the Haunted Historian. I've had a lot of fun kind of playing around with that and trying to figure out some cool little unique little things to do with it and some of our live investigations and such. Um, I think we're pretty much everywhere that you can be at this point, except for like threads or something like that. And I just don't have time to mess with I'm it. I'm in threads. <laughs> Are you? Well, I you're ahead of me. Use it there. Right? I've posted like five <laughs> things. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> it's I know it's like the, uh, the Twitter slash X alternative. Oh, I yeah. don't even do, I don't even do yeah. that. So, so that's probably why I don't know what it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm Facebook, and that's about it. And YouTube, I don't do Snapchat. You know, whatever. I just don't do it. I don't. I don't understand it. So, yeah. So, yeah. I've had a great time, folks. I'm glad you guys come on. And like I said, if you ha if you have anything else going on, that that is. We do have an event coming up. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. May 4th at the Museum of Radio and Technology in Huntington, West Virginia. Uh, we're doing our Erie Oddities Fair. It's okay. sort of an oddities haunted um, vendor fair. This is it's a, a mini version of our Erie Echoes that we put on each November. Okay. But we're going to have some speakers and some classes at this one, I believe. Plus yeah. lots of vendors selling fun, spooky, creepy, all kinds of cool items. Well, when you get uh, all the information together, you know, if you get a poster or something together, uh, send it to me and remind me. And, and hopefully I'm still doing this. I really I'm really enjoying it. This is only the second time I've done it. So I'll uh, I'll definitely, you know, put it out there for you all. Hey, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Well, you guys have a good night and we will talk to you again soon. All right, well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. All right, folks. I'm glad everybody came out to watch. Uh, I'm seeing there's quite a few people in there. Uh, I had a good time. Uh, the, the, Teresa and Brian are great. I, I love their uh, enthusiasm. I love their way of uh, I'm investigating. I've, I've investigated with them a couple of times. And as always, if you have an experience or if you've, whether it's a ghost, aliens, Bigfoot, um, doesn't matter. I'll listen to it all. Just send me an email at wvcase304 at yahoo.com. And uh, we'll see if you want to come on and we'll get, a, get you scheduled. And everybody have a good night. <laughs>